If you're in here today and you don't, you don't know who I am, maybe today is your first time. Uh, maybe you're tuning in with us for the first time today. My name is Alex Gallion. I'm the lead pastor here at Overflow. Um, I lead here alongside my wife and alongside an incredible team full of volunteers, people who aren't paid, people who have given their life to see the work of God that's happening right now through this church and, and through the body of Christ in McKenzie, to see that happen. People who give up hours and hours of their days to, to see um, this thing happen, to make what you see happening, to work with our kids and to play in the band and to ensure that we're safe and to set up and to clean and to make coffee. And before we move any further, would you guys take a second and honor everyone who made? Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody who, who, who you, you do that. And if you're in here today and that's not you yet, and you haven't gotten involved and you haven't taken your next step, then I encourage you, do it. Do, the, it you're, there's more on your life than just being a church attender. There's so much more for you. It's a core value of who we are here at Overflow. We're not consumers. We're contributors. We bring something to the table. You're not just made to come and sit in a church service for an hour a week and then go home and just live your life. There's more than that. There's a call on your life. There's a destiny on your life. And for some of you, the next step that you're going to have to take is getting connected to a body of believers, joining a small group, joining a team, going, giving up four weeks of sleeping in early and coming to the early service and going in growth track because you care about investing into you, and you care about investing into the kingdom of God. So I encourage you, if you haven't done that, do it. It's radically important. Um, and, and then I also want to do one other thing. Man, I feel like this is every single week with me. You, you already know it's coming. I'm going to honor somebody. I always do it. I have some special people in the room. Of course, my mom, my brother, my sister, who aren't normally here, are here today. I have another brother, Ethan, who's, who's always here, so I don't always you know, say anything about him because he's here every single Sunday. Uh, Miss Jeannie Jones is here today, um, a good family friend of ours. And then I have two other friends who are also here today. Um, Dakota and Brandy, would you guys just raise your hands real quick? Let them know who you are. Um, Dakota was in my wedding. I was in his wedding. We met Brandy shortly after, or like right before their wedding. We, we kind of became friends with Brandy. Um, I've known Dakota since he was in high school. Uh, he's one of my best friends of all time. He's pushed me deeper in the things of God than any single friend that I've ever had in my whole life. Um, I, I can attribute a part of who I am right now to him. And they, um, which I, this is their story to tell, but they're about to move to Japan for a year. And before they moved, they wanted to come and um, spend some time with me and Sam. But not only that, they wanted to come check out this thing, Overflow, that they've been seeing all the stuff about, they've been hearing about, and I talk about it all the time. They wanted to come see it for themselves. So just because y'all love me, would you just give it up for all of my special guests in here today? I love you guys. I love y'all. I love you. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I am sad to announce that today is the final installment of a series that has been going on for six weeks, entitled Built to Last. If you've missed any of this stuff, like Josh, I have it on here. I didn't know he was going to say that. I want to encourage you. We have an app. We have a YouTube page. We got a website. Go and catch yourself up, okay? Like, this stuff has been big for some people, and I want to make sure that you guys know, like, the resources are there. You can go and watch this stuff. You can go catch yourself up. So do that if that's you. Um, and just because today is our last time I want us to declare this one last time over our lives. Say this with me. Say, I'm built, I'm built to, last. to last. I love that. And in case, in case you guys didn't know, maybe it is your first time. Maybe you just haven't been keeping up with stuff. Maybe you realize how close it is. In just a few months, we are about to dive into a brand new season for our church. Um, we are about to physically move locations and be in a new facility. I know you're pumped about it. I know. I think, I think we are, we're all excited about it. And I, I do want to say this, though. Be sure that you're not on cruise control right now. You're not just letting these last eight or nine weeks just pass by. You're just coming in here, just doing the same old thing, church. Blah, blah, blah. Make sure you enjoy this. Because for some of you, you've been coming here for three years. I've been coming here for six months tops, maybe not even that long. And it's going to be like, whoa, we're leaving the vibiest little church building that's ever existed. 
But for some of you, you made this. You put in physical labor to, to turn this into what it is. So make sure when you're here, you're not letting a single moment slip by you and go unnoticed. Make sure your eyes are open and you breathe in the smell and you enjoy the heat that happens when the air conditioner doesn't work for the 1030 service. Like it's things that one day you're going to miss because you're going to look back and think, oh, those were the beginning days when it's a lot bigger than it is now. You're going to miss it. But just know better is coming. We're going to have a big sanctuary that's modern, that can fit more people, that can accommodate more souls, that meaning more lives are going to be changed because of where we're going. And we're going to have this thing. I mean, it is, it's a futuristic concept called a lobby <laughs> where you don't have to stand out in the rain or out in the blazing heat of summer before you come to the 1030 service. If I happen to go a little long, which I won't say it happens every service, but it might. If that happens, now you're going to have a place catch us, to sit and to be out of the elements and to get coffee and to talk to people to where you don't just have to come straight in and sit in your chair because there's nothing else to do because there's no room for you to even walk around. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have another real futuristic concept. The entrance it's going to be at the front of our building. <laughs> You're not going to have to invite people to come to church and say, yeah, it's really great, but when you get here, you have to go around back. You'll see the flags in the tent because you can't walk in through the main. You know that weird thing that you always, you always have to do if you've invited anybody? They'd be like, where do I come in at? I'm like, uh, in the back. It's weird. There's a staircase. Like You can, you can do it, but it's, that's not going to be there anymore. And Lord knows, if you work in kiddos, get ready. Because, oh, talk about a phenomenal kids facility. It is next level. I mean, this thing is sweet. I, I just hope you guys are ready for it. And of, of all the cool stuff that's coming, I would say that my favorite of all this stuff is the fact, fact, I don't know what I just said, <laughs> is the fact that we're not going to have restrooms right at our entrance. <laughs> We're going to have more than one restroom for everyone in our church. And th imagine the difficulties that come with the restroom being at the entrance. You know what I'm saying? You walk in, it's like, hey, welcome to Overflow for the first time. Pff, also, welcome to what he had last night. <laughs> I'm not going to get too far into that. But you know, if you've been that, per if you've been that person, you know who you are. <laughs> Ruined it for everybody else. And you know if you've been the person that walked in during that moment, you're like, Phew. Hello, this is not the smell of God. <laughs> this is something else. You know, like how nuts is that gonna be that, that we're getting that? Like we are stepping into a new season for our church. And so the reason that we entitled this whole series Built to Last is because when that season gets here, I want us to be ready for it. I want us to be prepared because as things are getting bigger and better, the challenges are also going to get bigger and tougher. There's going to be things that pop up that are even harder than they are right now. And, and we've all seen churches and people who weren't built to last. You've seen them. People who come and they get saved and they get changed and their whole life is flipped upside down for about three months. And then you look up one day and you're at church and you're looking around, you don't see those people and you see a sketchy post on Facebook and you can judge by that post that, well, probably they're in the same situation that they were in before this. What happened? Where, where are they? You've seen churches grow and thrive and be healthy and then you've seen churches shrink and fall apart and develop unhealthy cultures and we all have the potential to be those people and to be that church if we aren't built to last. And so within this series, we've been looking at some people in scripture, people, uh, most recently, we've been looking at some guys like King Saul and like Samson, guys who had all the potential in the world to be amazing, to do great things for God, who had favor, who were blessed, but they missed it. They missed out on all that God had for them. And the scary truth is that can happen. You can miss out on what God has for your life. You can miss out on walking 
in the more of God. And so we've been looking at those people trying to figure out what is it that can we not do? How can we look at their life and ensure that we don't end up like them because that's not where we want to be. And we've also looked at some people like David and Moses and Jesus and Abraham. People, who, If you've been in church for six seconds, you've heard of their names. You've seen the lives of these people. People who made a lasting impact, who, who like far sur surpassed anyone else in their generation, who did something really great for God. And we've been looking at their lives trying to figure out how did they do that? What is it about their lives that were so different? How did they make the lasting impact? How did they last as long as they did? How did they do and become who it is that they became? And we've been taking those principles from their lives and trying to apply it to our lives to make sure that we end up like them, people who are built to last. So I'm going to give you our title for our message here in just a second. But first, I want to dive in to our scripture for the day. We're going to be in Daniel chapter number six. Verses 1 through 16. Now, I say that because I want to make sure that you're ready. I'm about to read 16 verses, which means you're going to have to sit there through 16 verses. But it's okay because I don't know about you, but I love the Word of God. Okay? Now, is that okay with you guys? Can we dive into Scripture today? Does anybody else love the Word of God? See, that's what I love. Y'all just, y'all hungry right now. Keep, keep that up through this message, okay? Because things, things are about to get tougher. Just letting you know. All right? So, Daniel 6, 1 through 16, I read out of the New Living Translation, yeah, New Living, simply because it's just easier to understand. I don't like reading out of a version that I can't understand, because if I can't understand it, I know nobody else is going to be able to understand it. So if you prefer the King James Version, by all means, read it. Get your phone out. Use your Bible. Follow along with this. If not, you can follow along with us right here on the screen. So we're going to start out. Daniel 6, 1 through 16, this is what it says. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and to protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all other administrators and high officers, and because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then... The other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or to, or to condemn. He was faithful, he was always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel is going to be in his connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and the high officers went to the king and they said, long live King Darius. I mean, they just started puffing him up here. We're all in agreement. We, administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, governors, everyone but Daniel, that the king should make a law that'll be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of the lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it can't be changed, an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. So... Darius signed the law. Now, this is a really important verse I'm about to read, so I want you to pay close attention. Verse number 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual. Say this. Say usual. usual. He knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done. Say the word with me. Say always. Always giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Huh? King, did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person or human that prays to, or any person who prays to anyone divine or human except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yeah, the king replied. That decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, well, that man... Daniel, remember that guy? One of the captives from Judah? He's ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Well, hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament, looking for a loophole to, to figure out how to get him out. In the evening, the men went together to the king, and they said, your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of the lions. And the king said to him, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, 
rescue you. Now talk about a dude who was built to last. Daniel is a whole nother level. I know you've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den, okay? It's one that everybody has heard, whether they be churched or not churched. We all get the gist. And you know that at the end of the story, Daniel does make it out. God comes through and he saves him. But I want to make sure that we understand in here that the story of Daniel in the lion's den isn't the only story that surrounds Daniel. There was a lot of other things that happened in his lifetime. Daniel lasted, and I would even say he flourished through one of the craziest seasons of Israel's entire existence. See, because when Daniel was young, Israel was captured by King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they were forced to become Babylonians, thus giving up their old way of life. And it, even in this moment that could have been awful, that was absolutely terrible for some people, Daniel, we never find him crying or complaining about all that's happening that wasn't even his fault. But instead, we see him thriving. In fact, the Bible, it writes of Daniel that he was more capable, even as a young man, than any of the wisest men that Babylon had to offer. And so during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, all we see happening in Daniel's life is success after success after success after success. In fact, so successful that King Nebuchadnezzar sets him up as the ruler over the entire province of Babylon and as the chief over all the wise men. But then, after a while, King Nebuchadnezzar goes a little bit crazy, and things start going downhill, not only for Daniel, but for the entire kingdom. A guy named Belshazzar comes in and takes the kingdom from Nebuchadnezzar and causes a lot of problems. And then after a while, a guy named Darius the Mede, the guy who we just read about, comes in, takes the kingdom from Belshazzar, and he causes a lot of problems. One of those being he made people worship him. Okay, that's a problem. And it was a really a problem for Daniel. He signed the law that said if, you know, if Daniel didn't worship him, he was going to throw him into the den of the lions. And it happened. Daniel got thrown into the den. Now, we know, of course, the, the, the outcome of that story. But even through all of this, through being held in captivity to Babylon because of sins that Daniel more than likely never even committed, but the other people in this country did, through having to serve three different unstable pagan kings who didn't share any of his priorities, through having his life and the lives of his friends compromised time after time after time, we still see Daniel against all odds killing it. I mean, this guy is a beast. He's making it. And I believe that hidden within this story, we find one verse that gives us a world of insight into what it was that built Daniel into the person that lasted through all of these potentially difficult situations. And it's verse 10. And I'm going to read it one more time. It says this. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. I want you to help me preach this sermon today and just say this. Say, it's that easy. It's that easy. Now look to the people sitting next to you. I'm not going to make you look to just one person because then it gets confusing. Look to both people and just say, it's that easy. I love it. I, you, you see it. It's that easy. It's that easy. It's so much fun because you didn't just have to say it once. You had to say it twice this time. I'm mixing things up thanks to Jacob because he tagged me in a post this week that said it's always confusing. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take the confusion away. I'm going to make you say it to two people. So if you're taking notes today and you would like a title, the title for our sermon, it's that easy. It's that easy. Whenever uh, I, I know I'm 26 and I haven't had the time to learn a lot of things in life. Don't have kids. I've been married for a short time. But I have learned a few things. And one of the things that I've learned, and you'll agree with me, we have the tendency to overcomplicate things, to make things a little bit harder than they actually have to be. Take instruction manuals, for example. If I was writing instruction manuals, I can promise you they'd be much easier. Because if I can't understand them, I'm betting most of you can't either. And we're not good at it. And they're too hard. To, making friends. 
We make making friends out to be so hard. The, the, the thing is, it's not hard though. We learned how to make friends in kindergarten. You, this is how you make a friend, okay? If you're wondering, if you're like, Alex, preach a sermon on how to make a friend. This is how you do it. You be nice to people. You invite them to hang out with you. And then you don't say weird things. <laughs> it is that easy. Boom. You got a friend right there, someone who's going to be with you through the rest of the years of your life. You've got your buddy. Don't say weird things. Like It's, it's super simple, but yet we overthink it. And we think that we got to have the right haircut and wear the right clothes and eat the right food and watch the right movies and listen to the same music. That's not true, though. You just got to be nice to people, invite them to hang out, and then not be weird. And people will be your friend. When I think of things that we overcomplicate, though, you know the number one thing that comes to mind? Losing weight. We are good at overcomplicating that. Because scientifically, this is how you lose weight. You take in less calories than you burn. It is that easy. You're just taking less calories than you burn. Easiest way to do that, cut out all the really high calorie foods, fast food, fried chicken, stuff like that. Eat healthy foods, lean meat, vegetables, and then exercise. You will lose weight. I don't know what the speed is that you're going to lose, but you're going to lose weight. It's really that easy. But we don't like that. We complicate things. And we're convinced that to lose weight, we have to use a body wrap. We have to wrap ourselves in this stuff and like pour this pepper stuff in there so that it'll melt our fat away around our midsection and then go walk as fast as we can on the treadmill and sweat it off as, as if it's going to do something. It's not. It's a marketing scheme in case you're wondering. There's only one way to lose weight. Taking in less calories than you burn. But it's not easy. So instead of that, we would prefer weight loss pills. If you're like me. You know the pills I'm talking about. The pills that are still in your cabinet. You only took them four times because they made you feel weird. And you thought they were sketchy when you bought them anyways. But you were like, I'm going to give it a try. And they make your stomach hurt. And so you quit taking them, but they're there because you're convinced one day I'm going to get serious. I'm going to take these pills. But you never saw them work anyways. And you've never known a single person who got on the pills and it actually helped. But hey, why not? Let's use the pills. Let's bypass all the normal strategies that are clearly right in front of our faces about how to lose weight. And let's just take a pill instead. The problem is fat loss pill doesn't exist. It is a lie. That those things, they don't work. Let me save you from buying these things. They're once again a marketing ploy. They're not, there is no such thing as a pill that just makes you magically lose weight. It, do, it doesn't, if there was, we would all have it. We would all be losing weight because we take this special pill, but it doesn't exist. All right. And then this is my favorite one though, because instead of, instead of cutting chips and sodas and ranch dressing and French fries out of our diet, and instead of just simply going to the gym and walking, we would rather go on a 40 day juice cleanse. Instead of just doing the normal things, we'd rather drink beet juice for 40 days and torture ourselves. I know Alicia's laughing right now. I asked Josh if I could say that, if you were going to get offended, and he was like, no, she's going to laugh. We would prefer to just put ourselves through the pain of drinking kale and beets and carrots for 40 days so that we can lose weight really quick instead of just aiming for the long game and doing what has worked from day one, eating healthy and exercising. We make life complicated. We do it. We're humans. But here's the thing. We don't just make you know, our average everyday lives complicated. We make maintaining a good walk with God also seem so complicated because we think that we need endless prayer chains. And we think that we need the coolest church and the right songs and a church that fits our specific style in order to maintain a thriving relationship with God. But here's the truth. That's a lie. You don't need any of that stuff. All right. But if I told you what it was that you actually needed, some of you wouldn't like hearing it because it's way too easy. But because I'm your pastor and I love you, I'm going to give you the secret formula to maintaining a thriving relationship with God. If you sitting in this room or you watching online via your phone or through your computer screen, if you want to be able 
to have the faith that it takes to get you through the hardest moments of your life. And if you want to grow in your walk with God, and if you want to turn into the leader that you're supposed to be, then listen closely because here's the secret formula, all right? If you want to be built to last, then you got to read your Bible and pray. Now, see, I knew I wasn't going to get any amens from that one because it's too easy. We want to make it way harder than that, but it's just not harder than that. I know you're like, come on, Alex. Give me something better than that. Give me something fresh. Give me something new that I can chew on, the words we use in church. Break me off some revelation that I've never heard before. I've heard you the last couple of weeks saying stuff that I've never heard any preacher say. It was so relevant to my life, but come on, this, this, this is too easy. What are, you, what are you doing? But here's the thing. I could not be preaching a more important message right now because you planting yourself in the word of God and you regularly tuning in to the voice of God, it'll build you stronger than any sermon and any worship set and any conference ever will. If, if you leave church with some cliche phrases, then one, I haven't done my job. I failed. And two, you're not going to last. But if you leave today and you develop a prayer life, then God will use you to change the world. I can make you that promise. I've seen it happen a thousand times, and Scripture points to it as well. Look at verse number 10 one more time. What was it that set Daniel apart from everybody else? It wasn't the fast that he went on as a young man. I know we'll point to that. It was the fast, the Daniel fast. No, it wasn't. I've seen people fast and then years later end up as atheists. It's not the fast that sets you apart. This is what it was that set Daniel apart. Number one, a consistent prayer life. A consistent prayer life. I love how the Bible reads. It says he knelt down to pray as usual. It could have easily left that out and just said he knelt down to pray, but it couldn't because he prayed as usual. It was a part of who he was. It's what surrounded Daniel's life. It said he prayed three times a day as he always did. He didn't just say he got down and he prayed three times a day. No, it said as he always did. People knew that this was a part of who Daniel was. People understood that prayer is just who Daniel is. I love it because a crisis situation occurs. And the Bible doesn't say because of this crisis in his life, Daniel, Daniel knelt down to pray. Right? It, he didn't say he decided to kneel down to pray because he was having trouble with his money and his marriage was messed up. So he just got down to pray and he was really struggling in his thought life. So he got down to pray and someone was sick. So he got down to pray. No. It said he knelt down to pray as usual, as he always did. It wasn't anything weird for Daniel to be found praying because Daniel had a relationship with God. I'm afraid that there are some people in this room, and I've been there, who we say we believe in God, but we don't actually have a relationship with God. We believe in him. We put our faith in him, but we don't know him. We haven't spent time with him. We don't, we've never had a conversation with him. A consistent prayer life is the only way that you can maintain a lasting, meaningful relationship with God. But here's the problem. Everyone assumes that everyone prays, but we rarely actually pray. We all talk about praying, but no one actually does that much praying. We comment, praying for you, sister, praying for you, brother. We're great. We, I mean, we're quick. We leave that comment. But then we don't actually even pray for them. Or, and if we do, it's like a 10-second like, text to God. God, we just, we just bless them in Jesus' name. And then we do that. You know, I, I honestly, I wish that we would just stop commenting, praying for you, and we would take the time to sit our phone down and go into our room and get on our knees and pray for them. Your comment, praying for you, thinking about you, you know how many people that's changed? Zero people. It helps nothing. But you know what can change somebody forever? 
you go in and you're spending time with the God of the universe who has all the power, and you talking to him about that person, and you causing him to move on the earth, your prayer life can genuinely change the world. And I want to ask you, when was the last time that you just put down your phone and, and shut the computer and you turn the TV off and you let your kids do their thing and you quit talking to your girlfriend on the phone and you just went into your room and you just spent 30 minutes alone with God? When was the last time that that happened in your life? When, when was the last time that instead of venting to your friends, you went and you vented to the Lord? When was the last time that instead of opening up to Facebook about your problems, you went and opened up to God about your problems? When was the last time that you spent more time praying for your spouse than you spent complaining about them? Have you, have you ever been so caught up in intercession for your kids that you forgot they were even home? Has it, what, was it last year when that happened last time for you? Was it five years ago? Was it last week? Has it ever happened for you? Are you a person who actually prays? I remember in, in high school, that's when, when I got saved, I was about 16, is when I, I really fell in love with God, and, and in turn, I fell in love with prayer. And I would do this thing that I called a 30-30, meaning I would spend 30 minutes every single night reading my Bible, and I would spend 30 minutes every single night praying as a 16-year-old. Now, some people are going to say, oh my gosh, that is like, that is radical. The problem is it's not radical. We spend 30 minutes a day talking to people all the time. We spend 30 minutes a day reading Facebook posts. 30 minutes a day reading and talking and listening is not that radical. It's actually pretty normal for someone who says they believe in a God who is bigger and who can change things. And so I remember I spent 30 minutes a day just doing this stuff and uh, every night, whenever I was doing this, my mom, who's here today, would say that she just had to do laundry, and she would walk in on me every night. She didn't have to do laundry at that time. Don't let her lie to you. She just liked walking in on her son, praying and reading, because she thought it was really cool to walk in on her son, praying and reading. It's true. No, yeah, absolutely. It's true. She knows it's true. And so what she would do is she would just jump in there. And so sometimes what would happen, I would be so caught up in listening to the Lord or praying or interceding for a friend of mine who I wanted to have an encounter with God, or I'd be so caught up reading and the Bible would be coming to life to me and the spirit of wisdom or revelation is there. I'm getting something out of it and it's building me up that I wouldn't hear her coming down the hallway. And when she'd come in my room, I would, I'd jump because she'd freak me out. If you don't know me, that's what happens every time I get scared. My hands just go up in the air like that. I don't know why it happens, but it just happens. And I would just, whoa, just throw my hands up in the air. And the other day, something real similar happened here at church. Um, I was upstairs, but I was about to start writing a sermon. It was like a couple weeks ago. And I wanted to come down here and spend some time with God, just pray for a second before I started jumping into this sermon writing, because I just wanted to make sure that I was just hearing the right thing, that this was good, this is what he wanted, want to get some peace on it. So I come down here, but I'm having trouble praying because I'm afraid someone's going to like walk in the door. You would be so surprised, the people, the amount of people that are here through the week that don't knock, they just kind of come in and they're like, hello, anybody there? You know, you want to talk to somebody? I was so afraid that that was going to happen. I was kind of having trouble praying. And then the Holy Ghost was like, hey, Alex, do you think it'd be that big of a deal if someone walked in their church and saw their pastor praying? And I was like, you're a smart guy. You're, like, you're, <laughs> you're good. And so I just, I just was like, okay, fine. I'm not going to worry about it. And I got down on my knees in this chair, actually, Jacob. So if you feel anything special today, that's why. <laughs> I got down right here in this chair, got on my knees. I'm praying. I'm just seeking God. And I don't hear it when Chelsea closes the door of her car out there when Emily's with her. And so when they open the door and they come in, I jump up and I look at them and I'm freaked out again. I'm like, oh, and I literally looked at them. I was like, oh, you caught me. And I think, think it's funny, but I want to ask you, has your family ever walked in on you praying? What, what, what would happen, you think, in your family if your kids grew up and regularly saw you praying. 
Instead of only seeing you maybe pray or worship a little bit for 30 minutes on a Sunday, what would happen if they grew up and that was a normal thing, seeing mama pray, seeing daddy pray with mama, seeing a man of God in the house instead of a man who's too afraid to pray out loud? Seeing a man who, if someone asks you to step up on stage and pray out loud, you're not too afraid to do it because you do it all the time. It's not new to you. It's not crazy to get up here. You don't have to rehearse it because you do it all the time. What would happen if that was the case? Now, have, you, have you ever, has your family ever even had the opportunity to walk in on you praying? That never happened if they don't have the opportunity, if you're not actually praying who knows? Maybe you're more like me. Maybe you do pray. Maybe you love talking to God. Maybe you got your prayer list. And you just, I mean, you just go for it. Maybe if that's you, maybe it's time for you to stop being the one in the relationship that does all the talking and to start listening a little bit. What if what if you took some time and you didn't say anything in your prayer life and you just listen? See, God is communicating all the time. Sometimes it's in the fire and in the glory, and sometimes it's in the gentle nudge. Sometimes it's in the wind and in the waves and in the awesome, and then sometimes it's in the quiet and it's in the still. The question is not, is God speaking to me? The question is, are you listening to God when he's speaking to you? Because he is speaking to you. When was the last time, if you do pray, that you just put down your prayer list and you just spent 30 minutes in total silence, meditating and listening to God? When was the last time you were just quiet and enjoyed the presence of the Holy Spirit filling your room? as you thought about him? When was the last time you let the teacher, who the Bible calls him, the comforter, come into your room and just comfort you and correct you and teach you and guide you and build you into the person that you're supposed to become? Prayer is so much more than just a daily mark on your checklist. It's an opportunity for us, just awful, selfish, mean people to have a conversation with the God who created everything you see. It's a chance for you to spend time with and to interact with greatness itself. And yet, the problem lies in the fact we just can't find the time. So I don't have enough time to pray. I can't, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to have a prayer. I, just, I already don't have enough time as it is. I just, I don't know how that's going to, but we have enough time whenever we need something, right? Whenever we're really struggling and someone's sick and something awful is happening, all of a sudden we seem to find time to pray during those moments when someone's in the hospital or when you've lost your job. Isn't that funny? How when you lose your job, all of a sudden, you find yourself praying more than you've ever prayed in your life. But then when you've got a job and you're doing good, where's your prayer? It's just gone. It doesn't, doesn't exist. We, we, we never have time until we need something. And if we're being really honest, most of us, even, even if we do have a consistent prayer life, a lot of times our prayer life is, is just us asking God for things. And it's not always selfish things. Sometimes it's like, God, help my church. God, help this person. God, save them. But sometimes it is, you know, God, I need this. God, I need that. And that's great. But I, I, I hate, I don't want to be rude when I say this. But the truth is, sometimes we just view God like a sugar daddy. It, it's true. We would rather not actually spend any time with him and just get what he has to offer us. We don't actually want a relationship with him. We just want all that he brings to the table. We want him to meet our wish list. We want him to make things work out for us and give us a comfortable life. But we don't actually want to invest in time spent with him. 
or have conversations with him. See, prayer is, it's just so much more than that. It, it's, an, it's an honest conversation between a man and his wife. It, it's the place where God gives you your confidence and your joy and your peace that he promises you. It's the place where you start learning how to hear from God himself instead of always having need some, somebody else hear from God for you. A consistent prayer life separates those who say they know God and those who know God. That, that is the dividing factor. Worship services and small groups and sermons, they'll only get you so far. They'll only do so much for you. But a consistent prayer life, it'll change the fabric of who you are. It'll change how you see things and how you view yourself and how you view other people. It'll change your desires. It'll change the dreams that you have in your heart. It'll change the way you think about money. It'll change everything about you. It'll change everything about you. And while a consistent prayer life is drastically important, it's only half of the equation. You got to take it a step further. Because if you want to be built to last, one, you do need a consistent prayer life, but two, you also need a consistent word life. Now, let me, let me tell you what I, what I mean when I say a consistent word life. To put this really simply, you need to read your Bible. You need to fall in love with the Word of God. The Word of God that is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing spirit and soul. The Word of God that's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Word of God that's the hammer that breaks all the rocky places into pieces. The Word of God that is the very healing for my bones. And you got to know this stuff for yourself. You can't just rely on me to be the one who opens you up to all that the Word of God has to offer you. You have to have a relationship with the Word of God on your own. We, we see it in Daniel's life, too. He wasn't just a man of prayer. He was a man who was well acquainted with the Word. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 2 through 3. It says, During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the Word of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God, and I pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. We find Daniel reading the book of Jeremiah. The same book that is currently in our Bible right now. And when he's reading it, he realizes that in the prophecy that God had Jeremiah bring to the table, that Israel was only supposed to be in captivity to Babylon for 70 years. And he realizes that that 70 years is up. And so he reads that, and it says he covers himself in ashes, and he rips his clothes, and he starts praying, and he starts fasting, and you know what happens when he prays? God actually uses Daniel's prayer to deliver Israel out of bondage after 70 years. But Daniel would have never known the will of God had he not first known the word of God. The word of God reveals the will of God. God's word reveals God's will. So you can't even pray and then have a good prayer life if you don't know the word of God. You'll be praying things that are contrary to who God is. You can't even pray prayers that he'll answer. It's like, God, I just pray you'd get a back for being so mean to me. If you read the word, you know that ain't going to happen because he says, pray for your enemies. And he says, treat other people like you want to be treated. And we pray prayers like, God, I just pray you'd keep us safe on this road trip, safe from cops, <laughs> safe from getting tickets. But it, <laughs> I've been there. But if you read the word, you know that he says, well, if you just obey the law of the land, you don't have to worry about being punished right. by the law yeah. of the land. But you know what? It blows my mind how okay we are knowing nothing about the word of God. We place the hope for, of our entire eternity on the words in the Bible, and yet we don't know the words of the Bible. It doesn't make any sense. It is completely illogical to me why that's even a thing. Hear me. If you claim to be interested in God at all and you don't read the Bible, you're lying. You're not being true to yourself because you might be interested in 
community, and you might be interested in having some fun and making some friends and having really good feelings on Sunday mornings. But if you don't read the Bible, you're not interested in God. I can tell you that much. Because we make time for the things that we're interested in. We make time for Facebook and for ESPN and for the ball games and for the kids and for our spouse and for work and to go to the gym. We make time for all that, but God forbid somebody suggests that we spend some time reading the Bible because excuses come out of nowhere. Excuses that we didn't even know existed. We read Facebook for hours a day, but then we have the audacity to say, no, I'm just not a big reader. We'll say things like this. I just, it's just too complicated. I don't understand it. All the different translations out there. You sure you don't understand it, right? But this is the biggest one that we've all made. I just don't have time. No, you do have time. You make time for the things that you love. You just haven't made time for it. You do have time. And then all the other excuses out there, there are simple solutions to all of them. There's not an excuse in the book that's good enough, okay? So then we're left with this simple truth. We just don't care. We are fine letting the responsibility for our spiritual condition fall on the backs of our parents and our leaders and our pastors. But if you want to do something great for God, and if you want to grow in God, then it all starts with you falling in love with the Word of God. It really is that easy. See, nowadays, there, there are zero excuses for us having a relationship with the Bible, with the Word of God. There are thousands of translations that make it easier to read. You can listen to it. If you don't like reading it, you can get it on your phone, on your laptop, on your computer. Of course, you can get it um, as the actual Bible, you know, with paper. There are devotionals galore out there. There are enough devotionals available to make someone go crazy looking for a devotional for themselves. There are devotionals for women. There are devotionals for athletes. There are devotionals for singled single people, married people, college students, uh, doctors, men with tattoos, women who like cats. There are literally devotionals for everybody out there that is available to you right now for free via one app. It's so easy to do. And for some of you, a devotional would be an amazing way for you to start your walk with God. It'd be an awesome tool that you could use. There's so much insight, and they help you, and they're so encouraging, and they point you in the right direction. But for some of you, you've been in this thing long enough that it's time you put down the devotional, and you started learning how to dig into the Word of God for yourself. For some of you, it's time that you quit asking everybody else to do all of the work for you and to lead you into their revelation and into their understanding. And you grow up a little bit and you dive into the word of God that's right there in front of you and you learn how to hear from God on your own. Yeah. There, it blows my mind how many believers prefer to hear from God via somebody else instead of having an encounter with God for themselves, with God. Now, don't get me wrong. Start the devotional, but don't let it turn into a crutch for you. There will come a day in time when God's going to ask you to take a small step of faith and to put it down and to grow a little bit and to take some time and to dive into the scriptures and let the Holy Ghost speak to you for yourself. That time's coming for some of you. I still, I still remember uh, some, some of the, the first sermons I ever preached. And I still remember the title for, for one of them specifically. It was really catchy. Put a lot of time into it. Read and pray every day. <laughs> I hit someone hard right there. You're like, oh. Yeah, and so obviously, uh, I've gotten better at coming up with titles for sermons. Um, that one was yet yeah, a little bit cheesy. And even though that sermon 
was about five to seven minutes long at best. It's all I had to say. Because even then, I could have told you that there wasn't a sermon or a worship service or a conference that changed me like getting in the Word of God and praying on a daily basis changed me. There was nothing that changed me more. It was so powerful. It still is so powerful. And I realized even then how easy it really was. It was the first thing that happened to me when I gave my life to Jesus. I fell in love with the Word and with prayer. I, I wanted to grow in God. And I wanted to be with God. And I wanted to learn about God. And so the only normal step to take was for me to grow in those two things. And see, even now, I love preaching. I love church and worship services and, and, and all of that stuff. If I didn't, I shouldn't be a pastor, okay? I love all of that stuff. But even in the middle of that stuff, sometimes we're in a worship service and I'm, maybe I'm about to preach, I will find myself thinking, there's only one place that I'd rather be right now than in this service. I, I wish I could just be at home with my cup of coffee, reading the Bible, letting the Word of God change my nature. I wish I could just be at home in my office alone, just spending time with the Holy Spirit, hearing the voice of God, and, and letting it change who I am and letting him speak to me and correct me and grow me. Because tangibly, that is what a relationship with God looks like. It's really that easy. And for some of you in here today, the only response that you can make to this message happens when you leave. Do you say that you pray? Do you talk about praying? Or do you pray? Do you say that you're interested in God? Or do you read the Bible? Don't wait until Monday. We always do it when it comes time for a diet. Let me kill it one more day. Eat as much pizza and ice cream as I can on Sunday afternoon. And then Monday, I'm going to get things straight. Don't wait until Monday to start a Bible plan. Go home and do it tonight. Don't wait until Monday to start praying. Go home and pray tonight. Pray with your spouse tonight. But pray alone tonight. Learn how to spend time with God by yourself. Start that devotional. Spend that 30 minutes or that 15 minutes alone with God. It's time for some of us to begin investing in an actual relationship with the God whom we say we believe in. I wanna invite you guys, if you're willing or able, to jump up on your feet with me as we get ready to end the service today.